Welcome to the Insight Through Experience podcast, a podcast created to provide information about what life is like inside the most specialized special tactics organization in the U.S. Air Force. In these episodes, we'll be bringing you the experiences from many of our experts, ranging from our human performance optimization staff, our combat mission supporters, as well as our special warfare operators. Our main objective with these podcasts are to provide the listener with a unique look inside our culture of excellence in hopes that you will make the 724 a future career goal. Now sit back, relax, take some notes, prepare to hear from some of the Air Force's finest. Thank you for joining us on the Insight Through Experience podcast. Welcome back to the Insight Through Experience podcast, everybody. It is your host, Trey. We have another special week here on the program. We have what we affectionately call our psych squad at work. So we've got Lauren, who's a clinical psych. We've got Amy and Maria, who are clinical social workers. And then we have Megan, who's our peer network coordinator. Peer network coordinator really means um, a spouse liaison, if you will. So during this interview, we talked everything from the capabilities that the psych squad brings to the organization and its families. We're going to talk about their best day at work when they got to make a difference in somebody else's lives um, at work. We're going to give them an opportunity to brag on the HPO team from their vantage point and all the good things that they see going on from their perch. We're also going to talk about future capabilities that they're looking at instituting inside the organization to make the life of operators support folks and their families even better. So stay tuned. This week's going to be a good one. I think you'll enjoy it. Thanks you for joining us on the Insight Through Experience podcast. All right, everybody, welcome to the Insight Through Experience podcast. Ladies, I sure do appreciate y'all joining us today. Thank you for having us. Awesome. If you guys would, please uh, just give us a little bit, introduce yourself to the audience, give us a little bit about yourself and your background. Hi, um, I'm Megan Hughes-Willis. I'm the unit's peer network coordinator, um, which is code for a family liaison. I've been a government contractor for about um, five years, and I just relocated to the Fort Bragg area um, and have been with the unit since September. Uh, my name is Lauren Day. I'm uh, the clinical psychologist. I uh, completed both internship and residency in a military population. I've been with military and veteran for about six years now, and I specialize or I put an emphasis on post-traumatic stress disorder and TBI in my training. My name is Amy and I'm a clinical social worker. A little bit about myself, I received my undergraduate in social work from James Madison University and my graduate degree from the University of Southern California. I've worked hospice, acute psych, also for UCLA and MARSOC. I've worked within the soft arena for about six years. I currently sit out west supporting the 2-4 medical and the group staff. My name is Maria. I'm a clinical social worker and I earned my bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Washington. My background practicums is working with perpetrators of domestic violence and working in the VA PTSD clinic at American Lake. I currently work at Duke in their hospice unit, PRN, and I'm a clinical provider for the DET, which is their training unit, and I support STSS uh, for the 724. Man, so if, if I'm on the outside listening to this, I'd kind of be blown away by the level of um, support and the specialties that we have and the backgrounds and the education is impressive. Let's dig in a little bit deeper so we can understand what y'all do for the organization and the members inside. So to get us started, ladies, please just define your role, kind of go in depth and uh, what you provide specifically to the members of the uh, family, the families and the members of the 724. This is Megan. Um, my job specifically is to support all of the spouses. And um, if there is any time where a spouse needs to get in touch with someone in the command, they can always come through me and I'm able to go knock on someone's door and be like, hey, can you handle this? Megan, what does that look like? What does a spouse expect? So when they get to the organization, when is their touch point with you and what can they expect out of that role? Um, so as soon as they're hired, they are asked for their spouse's contact information. And as soon as that's given to me by their commander, um, I reach out with an email and I'm like, hey, I'm Megan. Send them a bio about myself. And then if they want to, I'll add them to a spouse network distribution list and they get weekly updates on events and things that are happening. So this is Lauren. I'm going to jump in probably 
uh, talk more about what the clinical side does, and I may speak for uh, Marie and Amy right now. We primarily, we provide individual services. We also provide couples counseling. Um, if somebody has an issue where it comes to a child, we tend to refer that out into the community, but we do make sure that we tap into outside resources so that everybody's taken care of. We work on things like sleep. We, we treat post-traumatic stress disorder, acute stress disorder, adjustment pre and post deployment. We, um, we will run groups dependent on what the unit need is. We will place consults for different medical devices that are adjunct to treatment. We see uh, service members at work. We see spouses at an outside location so that we have access to families. We do a lot of stuff here. I think the one thing that sets the psychologist apart from the social workers and is very small is that I do psychological assessment for diagnostic purposes or to obtain waivers, uh, which is different than the psychological assessment used for assessment and selection. But that's a little brief synopsis of what, what kind of services we provide. Lauren, if you had to break all that down, because that's some amazing stuff, you had to break it down to the basic layman sentence what is it that you do for the 724 we keep their minds healthy i think that's the the basic way to say it just to piggyback off that that was excellent lauren but pre anything from prevention to on fire and burning down clinical care the realm of that that's what we cover yeah beautiful awesome awesome thanks Maria, I'm going to ask you something direct. What are some of the strengths since you've gotten there? Because I remember when you got there and it was awesome to have you come into the debt. But what are some of the you walked into that environment? What were some of the strengths that you would just instantly noticed with what we're building here with the family support and the uh, operator support network? I think within the debt specifically, it is that everyone there is really willing and able to support. And that's an environment that I've never really experienced before where you could walk up to somebody and say, hey, I need help with this. And they might not be able to help you, but they can walk you over to the person that can. And I think that that's, that's a space that isn't typically found in other areas or like, it's not my job, not my problem. And that's not how it is here. And so having, you know, walking into that environment where everyone is willing to help, it kind of like opens up the door. So when you do need help and you, you ask for it, you're able to get it. And oftentimes people think they're like, oh, I'm not even going to ask for this or I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole because I'm not going to get the support that I need. And that's not true for this for this unit. It's um, and it's not just with the service members. It's with the families and the kiddos as well. It's it's the ripple effects of the amount of support that we offer is pretty vast. Just wonder, uh, as I saw you come in and integrate, and I've been here a long time. So when we didn't have you guys and when our first psych started coming in, um, I mean, we always had at least one, but nobody would use them. Everybody was scared to go because that's going to mean you're going to get pulled off, um, you know, status, which is totally not the case anymore. Starting with you, Marie, and then I want to spread this out to everybody is what has the integration been like, especially with the operators since you've been there? Uh, what have you noticed? I think Amy said it well when we were talking the other day. It's like, if you build it, they will come, right? So we have an amazing team of providers, not just the clinical team, but from Megan and the HBO staff that are really integrated. We sit where everyone is located. We make ourselves very accessible to folks. So that way, if they do need something, they can receive it. And I think it's our drive to provide this community with what they need when they need it that kind of allows people to say, hey, look, these are good people that we can talk to and we can put our trust and value in them and they're gonna give us and provide us with the support that we need to continue doing our job down the road. It's not gonna prevent us from doing it. It's gonna allow us to continue. And, and I think that's, that's one of the biggest things. Amy, how is it um, at D24? I mean, um, based on, on the dialogue that Marie and I had, um, the if you build it, they will come is, is a true um, testament to really um, the hard work that people do through the assessment and selection process. So we not only do that with the operators, but also through the staff that provides support um, specifically embedded to support the service members and their families. So um, I, I know that when I was a clinical provider here by myself for six months, I was getting a little bit impatient because I was getting so much flow and so much traffic, 
but um, our command psychologist, Chad, was very thorough in making sure it was the right fit for the organization. He wanted people that were humble, hungry, and smart. And I am so thankful because the peers that I work with, they care. Um, their clinical acumen and their competency is top notch, but also I think that the trust factor is there. And I think that um, really when it comes to service members, they vet you and there's a reason for that, right? And I think that there's value in the fact that um, we do have enough of that trust and confidence that they feel comfortable coming to us and being very vulnerable. And so it's our honor to continue to support not only them, but their families as well. And I think that um, our caseloads speak to the fact that they do have that trust and confidence in us. Megan, I want to move to you because we sit close together too inside the debt and you coming in, we had a gap there for a few months, you coming in trying to get established. How was that? And how's been the, how's the relationship been with the spouses and the operators since you got there? Yeah. So before I got here, I think there was a pretty big gap in this position not being filled. And so people didn't have someone to put events together or communicate to them what's going on in the unit or be that middleman for them to come to if they need something from someone in the unit. So when I first started, there was a little bit of, um, I wouldn't say distrust, but distrusted it. You know, if I was going to be or trustworthy or if they could come to me. Um, but I've been persistent and consistent and have <laughs> infiltrated <laughs> and have made some really awesome friendships. So it's going good. What has been the hardest struggle for you um, up to this point? Or maybe just when you got established, what, what was the most difficult thing? Um, I guess getting people to come to events. At first, it was just me going and sitting at a park by myself. Got a little discouraged, but I would go sit there and eventually people started to show up. And meeting people who were new in the area and didn't know anyone yet was really cool. So getting them integrated to the network and then allowing them to, or being the bridge for them to meet other spouses and actually grow their network. And so now they're not new in the community anymore. Yeah, Lauren, I want to move over to you real quick and just ask how your integration is with the unit that you're currently assigned to and uh, what that daily life is like. Um, so I didn't say previously, I sit in our data mass uh, squadron and that was a difficult integration um, initially. I think that they were a little skeptical skeptical about me um, coming into their spaces. But I think that we are very fortunate as providers that we are truly embedded and we have leadership that supports that 100 percent. And so I get to go on training trips. I get to sit in their spaces. I get to attend their meetings, their morning meetings and everything like that. So I'm, my face is very present. And I feel like because of that, with time, they got to know me, they got to trust me. Um, and people just started to do more drive bys, like maybe put their toe in the water of psych and let me come ask you a question and see what you do with that information. And over time, I think it's been very positive and I've gained a lot of trustworthy relationships and people who come to me. Um, and so I am very fortunate for our, our truly embedded roles. I'm going to ask you the same question and kind of put you on the spot, but what has surprised you since you've been over at the data mass unit? What has surprised me? I, I think the amount of time to integrate surprised me. I think some people told me initially that it was going to be hard. Um, I don't think I recognize, you know, how long it would have taken um, and how persistent I had to be with with being at different activities or putting myself out there or giving certain talks on whether it was suicide or sexual assault um, before that, that relationship really built. But once it's there, you can't break it. Um, so that was a little surprising. Awesome. Amy, I'm coming back to you. Uh, what about the 2-4? What about your time at the 2-4 so far has surprised you? I think that what has really surprised me is the whole alone and unafraid aspect. I think that with the 2-4, coming from a soft community, we have these teams and they really have that camaraderie and the bond. But what I think is so essential to really understand and conceptualize is just how these, these people and these service members go to places and spaces and um, it's just really impressive and remarkable how they attach to other entities and are able to do their skill set like no other. And um, that was a learning curve for, for me a little bit, but it also um, kind of changes maybe some of the understanding of 
how these people form relationships and the camaraderie. And I think that I was naive to that before. So it surprised me. Many of you, then I think this is going to build some commonality with the spouses that we have at the organization, the ones that are coming in, because many of you are married to military spouses as well. So just an overhead question to everybody, how has that helped shape how you conduct your business at work as well? I think for me, it's given me a level of a deeper level of understanding and compassion and empathy because I feel the same anxieties that they felt. I kind of understand on a deeper level kind of what they're experiencing, even though all experiences are different. And so coming to them with that level of compassion and caring um, and kind of saying like, this is really hard and I understand that this is really difficult and I've been in that place and here are some mistakes that I learned along the way so that way you can have that knowledge and um, allowing them to kind of I'm walking alongside them during this transition and this path. I'm not guiding them. I'm not taking them where they don't want to go, but I'm, I'm with them on that journey that they're on. I was going to say the exact same thing, Maria, just being able to understand how they feel, um, being able to have empathy and communicate what I've gone through, even though it may not be as long or as seasoned, I guess. But um, yeah, just connecting with them and letting them know that it's going to be okay. Same exact thing. Um, I'm going to throw out the caveat that my experience is mine alone. Um, and while operators have some of the similar traits, we as spouses can be so similar and so different. Um, but my spouse was an operator in a different soft community for about 25 or 24 years. Um, so I can empathize with the ops tempo and a lot of the trends that spouses currently see. Um, I knew the old beeper system instead of phones. So I would get the same reactivity when he would have to leave with an hour's notice. Um, or not be gone, but immersed in that training. Um, and I think that over communication and normalization is really key um, because while we as spouses are different, we do have those similar challenges, whether it be with kids, the stress, the ops tempo, um, relationships. And I think that living this lifestyle has really given me the opportunity to guide kind of a dialogue and support in more of an empathetic way. Um, and it's also really enabled me to support prevention and getting left of the boom uh, because we are, you know, we are embedded support for a reason because of some of these stressors. So if nothing else you hear that I say today, prevention is key. So if something is going on, let us know so that we can support and cover down. That's a great, great answer. Great story. I as well grew up here on the pager system i had the pager attached to my hip for the 11 years i was operating so funny to hear that story from somebody else but next thing i'd like to to know from you guys is what are some of the common stresses or some of the common things that you deal with here in your roles when you're dealing with spouses and operators um, with our operators our service members we do see uh, ptsd depression anxiety uh, we see a lot of sleep problems um, some adjustment disorders when it comes to the family stuff or the marital piece, we do see a lot of marital discord. Um, we have been seeing some postpartum depression um, and we've seen uh, children's adjustment to parents returning as well. So those, I think, and let me know if I'm wrong, Amy and Maria, that's generally kind of the, the wave tops of the most common things that we see. And then for the spouses, it's kind of interesting. Um, a lot of the things that I see, I usually just push to... Um, either Lauren, Maria, or Amy, um, but people who are struggling with their first deployment or, or the spouses who are struggling with their spouse being gone for their first deployment or how their kids are responding to their dads being gone for like the first time or for a long period of time. So just taking all of those comments and connecting them with the providers who are better qualified to help them and help them understand what they're going through and, and kind of normalize it. I think the great thing about having the family liaison like Megan is that, you know, from experiencing this lifestyle, we normally talk to the people the left and the right of us, right? The people that are in that experience. So what's great with Megan as the coordinator is that she is able to kind of give us that information so that we can best set them up for success. And she already has that rapport with them, which is invaluable. I just want to throw in um, to back up what everybody has said and especially what um, some of the issues that Lauren brought up. Beautiful thing about having y'all here now and what Lauren just identified are some of the commonalities that she's seeing is that we 
know that they're here now. They were always here before, right? They were always, they're in every unit out in ST and rescue right now. They exist everywhere. The beautiful thing about having y'all here now is we have identified it and now we can treat and move on and get them healthy and keep them healthy to keep doing their job, keep the families healthy to keep supporting that guy downrange or the folks doing the mission. So what are some of the best practices y'all that, that y'all are implementing that people around you are implementing that are really making a difference um, inside the organization? I think one of the things, um, I have a, a clinical passion for PTSD, which is why I place such an emphasis on that in my training. And when I came here, we um, our, our practice was to refer people out to PTSD programs that were, you know, two weeks to a month long. And what I did is I tried to bring a similar program here to the 724. <clears throat> and in that program, we have created a two-week condensed cognitive processing therapy group where the service member attends daily and completes what would generally be an individual 13, 12 to 13 week protocol within two weeks. They get the time off of work, they get to intensely focus on whatever trauma they're processing without the added stressors of being at work. And then they get to return to duty very quickly without going on TDY or being away from their families. That's one of the things that um, we have recently added, and I think is going to grow in popularity as we move it throughout each of the squadrons. Well, some of the feedback from that, Lauren, that you've gotten from folks who have attended, I know it's new, but um, from the few that have attended. We got very uh, positive feedback, um, both in their assessments pre and post. So the, the feedback in regard to their symptoms were significantly decreased. So we track depression, we track PTSD, generalized anxiety, sleep, and we saw improvements in each of those areas. But I also got positive feedback just that it was local, that they didn't have to go TDY, that they could stay near their families, um, and that they knew who I was. I think that was one of the best feedbacks is uh, I didn't have to go talk to a provider who doesn't necessarily know what I'm doing here and hasn't had my experience or your experience with us. And so I think that trust, again, really played, played into this process being so successful. Some other back best practices that we've created, um, Reset Week, which is all-encompassing. Um, it deals with the spiritual component, the medical component, the psychological component, also um, strength and conditioning, our physical therapist. But it's really a time to literally reset, um, and we really focus on prevention. There's a lot of one-on-one -on -one appointments to, again, get that rapport and really get honest, candid feedback on what the service members are, are going through. And um, we really, at that point, kind of see what trends are going on there. But also, we can kind of, we do a green, yellow, and red system to kind of capitalize on that prevention to, hey, this person really needs that support. And so the colors are the value of kind of letting us know, hey, I need to now reach out to this person and make sure that this person is getting taken care of, whether it be muscular skeletal, whether it be from our site component. Um, but I think that we're trying to really trend towards prevention um, before it gets to that impairment, because we want to keep guys in the fight and doing what they love to do. Um, and we want to ensure that they're healthy. Right. So I think that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is brown bags. So Monthly, um, with COVID, we've been doing it more more recent um, and, and more often, but we really want to focus on trends that we see and topics that um, either service members or their families are experiencing and kind of providing them support with an hour long um, conversation where hopefully, you know, there is some some back and forth dialogue there, but just the information and education to again, they see our face, they hear our voice but then also they get that information and can follow up with us. Amy, give us a quick um, example of some of those brown bags. And when she says brown bags, literally we send out a link to everybody over email and they host a one hour session, um, training session on something. I remember PTSD. I remember Rachel Jensen doing teaching. What are some of the other ones that we have done? So just a few off the cuff. Um, giving and getting support for relationships, which is value added. Um, obviously, anger management, because emotional regulation is something that um, we all have challenges with, and even kids have challenges with. So uh, that anger management piece as well. Um, sleep, because number one problem that service members have is chronic pain. Number two problem is sleep, but even spouses have problems with sleep. Um, so 
those are just a couple of um, some of the brown bags that we've done. Yeah, I want to piggyback on this subject a little bit too, because as we talk about reset, as we bring operators into the organization specifically, and as soon as they get here and in process, and then the first week of OTC, we do something called peak performance. And that's where we invest in them for a week and we teach them a little bit about themselves from the feedback that we garnered. And then we give them some of these tools by unleashing the HPO staff on them um, in mass. And then as they travel through the OTC process, that HPO team surrounds them and supports them as much as possible. Then once they graduate OTC and they move over to the 2-4 STS, that support doesn't go away. As they move through that and they go on um, overseas and come back, that's where that reset comes into play. The HBO team masses around them again. And like Amy said, they kind of reset them back into hopefully getting them back to that resilient level that um, what I like to say, leveling the bubbles out again to keep them performing at optimal levels. It is a special place and it is all strategically oriented to keep the operators happy, healthy, their families happy and healthy and keeping the mission moving forward. Another thing that we do, Trey, is that pre and post deployment, we do, I've been going to the, an offsite area where spouses can come and I can normalize what they're going to experience when their spouse comes back from deployment or what it's like when they leave for deployment. I can also talk about the impact that are on kids and how to reintegrate service members into their family structure after they come back from deployment. Another thing that we've often that we've done recently is that we've integrated ourselves into a marriage retreat that happens after guys come back from deployment. So it's it's all expenses paid at a at a location like we went to Wilmington. We've also gone to South Carolina. Uh, it's typically three days, and we have you know, I lecture for three hours about how to, you know, build a stronger relationship and how to give you skills and we do activities um, and just kind of reinforce that family function and how to help service members reintegrate back into that relationship. And I think that's been really effective. We've been asked to do it over and over and over again. Uh, because of COVID, we haven't been able to do it in a while, but that's something that people are asking for because they really enjoyed it. And that's another way for us to support families so that they have a better understanding and how to grow through all of this as well. And to piggyback on uh, Amy and Maria, before COVID, um, myself and the chaplains were trying to establish a way to incorporate the spouses into Reset or either create a spouse Reset Week where the spouses kind of get some of this information and training that their um, service members get, and then also provide like a day for the service members and their children to go bowling or something while the spouse goes to the spa, which is relatively inexpensive, but would be really, really appreciated. Um, so that's something that's also value added. So let's imagine that COVID has just kind of redefined and we don't know, we don't know where this is going. None of us do. So let's let's imagine that it's here for a year or two. What are what are some things? And this goes out to everybody, but I'm just focusing on Megan first. Of what are some things the organization's looking at doing to keep us healthy, um, even when we can't get together like we'd like to do? Yeah. So as soon as COVID hit, I think it was mid March. Um, I don't think that the HPO team or the psych staff miss, missed a beat at all. So that following week, we had an, a virtual training for spouses and service members, the brown bags. We had newsletters that um, mainly Maria and Amy pulled together with a vast amount of information, like financial information or activities for kids, free books, anything. So as we're kind of moving out of like this COVID phase and starting to reintegrate into society, um, I'm re-upping meeting with people and things like that. Um, I'll go one-on-ones or we can social distance coffee, so. I think that speaking um, from the clinical providers, the one nice thing about our job um, is that we can do telehealth. And so I think that the positive of COVID, because I always wanna reframe on, on the positive, um, is that a lot of guys who normally their ops tempo don't give the time and space to kind of um, see us with continuity. So for example, maybe we'll see someone and then they have to go on training. And so um, there's a lapse in time. I would say a positive and something I can glean from this is that I've had a lot of continuity of care uh, for treatment for service members and the same for spouses as well. 
And so um, that has been a positive uh, from the COVID experience. And I think that's something that um, has been invaluable. All right, I'm gonna get some positive emotions going here. What I would love for y'all to describe is a day you got to do your job. You got to um, go in and make a difference in a family's life, operator's life, a support person's life, or all of the above. And you went home just feeling like you made a difference that day. If y'all would individually just describe what that day was like and uh, what the situation surrounded it was and, and just give us an insight of what that was like. Um, different cycles of people are gone at different times. And when certain things happen, more people will leave. And there was an unexpected amount of people who were gone and the holidays had just passed and um, Valentine's Day was rolling up. So um, I decided to, well, the idea spurred from a conversation I had with one of the spouses and uh, we decided to do 26 Valentine's Day baskets for people whose spouses were gone. And um, we put them all together and we delivered them on Valentine's Day and it was really fun and I felt like um, it was a complete surprise to a lot of the spouses and it was really well received from the spouses and the service members who emailed the commander and were like, hey, this is really awesome. So that was one time where I felt like I made a difference in someone's life that day. Um, I had the experience, unfortunately, uh, we had a tragic death in the unit um, and I flew out to where that death occurred and I was able to meet with the rest of the team and provide psychological services closest to the incident, which has the best outcome for their prognosis. Um, so being able to be supported by the unit, be supported by my leadership, be supported by my fellow colleagues, to be able to get there to provide that service and then follow those followed that service member's teammates through the grief process, through the trauma process, um, and kind of protect them or shield them or help them process everything that they were going through. Uh, that was a time where I really felt like I did my job and I did it well, and I was able to possibly prevent some severe pathology or trauma that could have resulted from that. So I felt uh, that that was an incident where I really I went home happy, although it was a very sad situation. One experience, um, unfortunately, a spouse service member and their family got some traumatic news about the development of a child um, during pregnancy. And we were able to, as um, a unit and really just within, you know, all the different pillars come together and support the family through the initial onset of the crisis, but also, um, case manager was involved with certain things and in supporting um, to ensure appointments were, were taken care of. So it was one less stressor, um, you know, you know, different uh, spiritual support was offered as well, but also, you know, checking in with the spouse daily um, to just ensure that her, her needs were met. Um, I am still in contact with that um, family. They are doing well. They are actually thriving at this point And, um, have mentioned um, on numerous occasions how grateful they are for the support within the community that we have um, because you know the there are a lot of stressors um, whether internal or external but the positive is is that with the embedded capabilities that we have we are able to in in a situation where that is there you know that negativity we are able to come together at rapid fire and ensure that people are wrapped in support I had been working with a couple for a while and then COVID hit and I was able to really support this family in their moment of need. Um, the spouse had some complications uh, from a pregnancy and she had been in contact with our medical provider that's on site and I had been in contact with her and it was determined that she needed to go to the emergency room. Uh, because of COVID, they had two other children at home and they couldn't leave those kids in the care of other of someone else. And the spouse couldn't go by herself, uh, but her husband also couldn't drive her. So I packed up my car. I got some water and graham crackers and I was like, here I come. And I drove over to her house and I repacked her go bag um, because she was just too sick to do it. And I 
drove her to the emergency room and I sat in the parking lot and I waited and I was texting her husband updates and because of COVID, they wouldn't let me into the hospital to be with her. And I should say that on the way to the hospital, I was able to decrease her anxieties that she had and we were able to kind of talk her down and do some breathing exercises. So that way when she walked into that hospital, she was as prepared as she could have been. And I, I waited in that parking lot and it was a really long day and it was probably like eight o'clock at night. She, I got the message that she was being released from the hospital and I drove up to the entrance to the emergency room and I put her in my car and I gave her some graham crackers and I asked, I talked to her about her experience and what that was like and I drove her home. And the next morning I checked on her and like I continued to do that for the next couple of days and I, you know, just to make sure that they had what they needed when they, when they absolutely needed it. It was the worst moment of their life and I was able to support, support them and to make sure that they both were comfortable and they felt like they were in the care that they needed in that moment. And, and that was a really good day. Those are some special stories. Uh, wow. Kind of floored sitting here. That's hard to, uh, that's hard to follow up. My task at the organization is to go around and try to recruit operators. And we have some other guys who go around and recruit support folks. But the biggest challenge for me during my time is the operators want to come. It's, we're trying to recruit their spouses and let them know what this is going to be like so they can make a better decision for them and their family before they show up here and realize this was or was not the right um, maybe location or unit for them. We just did a whole podcast on this last week a little bit with the spouses, but from your guys' specialties, what are some of the reasons that you've seen so far that spouses should decide that the 724 is probably a good move when it's time for them to pick their families up and move to their next base. Why the 724? I really truly believe that the team we have here is second to none. When it comes to medical, psych, HP, we have the best of the best. We have team members who truly care. Uh, we don't just see this as a job. We're passionate about helping not just the operators, not just support, also their families. Um, and I've seen each one of us on this call and every single member of our HPO team go above and beyond um, for service members and their spouses and their families. And I have worked in a lot of different organizations and I haven't seen that there. This is a home, this is a family, and this is a place where people truly, truly care. Just to piggyback off what Lauren said, um, I'm going to put some some of the guys I know on blast. There are some guys that, you know, are transitioning out and some guys that um, are in the potential to PCS. And one of the things that they always tell me is that, man, the care that I get here, it's top notch. And that's a concern that I have is is leaving that. So one thing that I'll say is, you know, the trends and the stressors are symmetric with other ST pararescue. And, and I think that Trey touched on that. But the way in which we surround our people and take care of, you know, the operators and their families, we care. And there's a reason why we came into this environment and why we drive so hard, just like the operators do. And it's because we, we have that compassion, um, not only for the guys and their families, but also for the mission, right? And in the day that we stop feeling that is the day that we need to go. Okay. So I think that um, the passion that we have, the fire in our belly, it really is a reason why, you know, spouses should come here. Um, and also just the relationships that, that people get within this environment. Um, and, you know, I, I think that Megan can probably touch on this as well, but the people form, you know, their, their tribes. And that's one of the things that is great within this community too, is that we have a lot of different things. Um, you know, I've lived in, in North Kakalaki for a while now, but, um, you know, some people have different mindset on it, but, you know, it's, it's what you make of it. And I think there's some amazing things here um, and some amazing people and an amazing mission. All right. I want to pick it back on what Amy had said earlier, too. And I think a lot of this has been made possible. And I'm going to put Chad on blast. But because of just like you said, he hires a specific way. Um, I've been in a lot of those hiring processes and he has by far, I think, the best work center and and y'all coming together to make the decisions on who comes in to support our folks. Uh, I think that has been the difference maker, too. So the team we have here is special. It's hard. I always debate, hey, do I go do something else if I've been here too long? It's hard to leave what we have going on at this organization. I'll, I think we are a 
trying to say this all humbleness. I think we are a gold standard out there in the community right now. And I, I really wish like I'm inviting some people to come down and watch P performance because I want them to see the goodness going on here so we can replicate that out. So everybody's getting the same type of care. Everybody cares out there. There's no doubt about it. Not everybody has the resources, but maybe we can display some tricks or some techniques. Tricks is the wrong word, but some techniques that we're using that could help everybody out there because everybody's facing these same things. What is on the horizon for you ladies, maybe in your specific roles, maybe as the HPO in general, what's what can people look forward to um, in the next few months and the next few years as this keeps progressing? Something that I have found is uh, generally operators don't want to sit down with us and talk about their feelings right off the bat. It can make them pretty uncomfortable. So I am trying, and I've, I've worked with our sports psychologist, Ben, who is incredible at trying to incorporate some of this technology into my practice. And so by getting technology like our whoop bands, I just ordered um, some different biofeedback bands called the Apollo. They, they provide measure, like it's objective numbers. When I can show somebody an objective number, and if you increase your sleep, then your recovery increases this amount. Yes, I'm doing psychology. I'm getting them to do relaxation. I'm getting them to practice sleep hygiene. I'm getting them to take care of their bodies and their minds. But for them, it's a competition. So I'm trying to incorporate these things to, to make psychology more, um, I guess, user-friendly for them. And so that's kind of a track that I'm going to continue down. That COVID has really tested us and it's been a great way for us to kind of think outside the box. And so us continuing to adapt and overcome and be resilient despite the obstacles. So um, if, you know, in the event that there's still going to be social distancing and things of that caliber um, and in that continuity, um, I think that we will continue to revector and provide support. And I think that like Lauren said, touching on the technology piece, we do have a lot at our disposal to continue to lean in and support the spouses, the the children, um, the service members as well. And so just ensuring that, you know, um, really just asking uh, for that feedback of, you know, what, what trends do you guys see amongst yourselves or what would you like more of? and really just um, getting that feedback. And I think that that's an amazing thing within our organization too, is that we rely on that feedback. Um, because, you know, the day that I stop learning and stop getting that feedback, that's another day that I need to go because we can always grow and evolve and um, do better and, and be better. So I think that we have a lot of awesome stuff um, on the horizon. I think to piggyback off of Amy too, just to talk about the HPO team in general, right? So we recently hired a neuropsychologist who's implementing and received training in a, a system called the MERT program. And it was originally over in San Diego. We have to fly people out there to go use the system to kind of combat um, TBIs and have some high tech brain treatment. And she was able to bring that program here and now we offer it in house. And I think that goes to the consistent improvement of us and what can we offer those people that we serve and to, to really focus in on what the need is and to be able to kind of say like, okay, this is a need and this is how we're going to solve it and be able to move forward with it. And by using this high tech um, electromagnetic pulse to retrain the brain and to help sleep and relaxation and improve your mood and overall concentration for guys who've struggled with TBI is like, that's amazing because a year ago, this wasn't even on our horizon. And now it's a reality for us and for the service members that we have. Like, and that's amazing. I'm going to give each of you about 30 seconds, if you would. And I want you to brag on the HPO team. You can go straight humble. I don't care what you do, but you get 30 seconds each to brag on the people that you work with. I want to start by bragging about the psych team. I think that we are just amazing. <laughs> I'm not going to keep it humble on this one. I think that we have knocked it out of the park with COVID. I think we are a very strong team. I think we are passionate. I think that each each one of us has built such an extraordinary caseload, and we have such a good trust and um, connection with each of our respective squadrons. That is a hard task. We have built it, and not only have we built it and they have come, we have maintained it and we have grown it. And I think that people see you guys with a lot of respect and um, I'm proud of you guys. I want to brag on um, 
med. We have people who constantly return phone calls, who help with complex issues, who support psych when we need it. We have an amazing sports psychologist. We have great op psychs. It's just this team and how we interact together. Like uh, there's, there's not enough positive that I can say about it. I would not be able to do my job the way that I do it without the rest of this HPO team. I want to brag on um, our team specifically, um, and then especially the three ladies on this call, Lauren, Maria, and Amy. They work nonstop. They go above and beyond, I think, every single day. Um, there's not anything that they wouldn't do. Just like my main role is to work with spouses. Their role isn't necessarily to work with spouses, but they do because they choose to. And they choose to do things at 8 o'clock or choose to do things on the weekends or holiday birthdays. Um, they go above and beyond. And it's really awesome when you can work someplace where you actually have lifelong friendships that you're making, um, not only with people you work with, but um, with the spouses as well for me. Um, so this team is awesome. And I've been really, really lucky to work with you guys. Drag on Megan for a second, um, because I've lived this lifestyle and I've, I've experienced the, the family liaison um, component. And I think that the way that she embedded there is just so much um, compassion there, and they have a lot of trust in Megan. Um, within the whole HPO component, I love the fact that we do treatment team meetings and have all pillars there with the service member and sometimes um, spouses there as well to kind of just say, we're all in a room together. Let's flatten those comms. Let's do better, be better. Let's figure it out to ensure that you're taken care of. Um, and I mean, you know, I know that, that our time is all valuable and I know that um, we are all busy, but we are never too busy to take care of service members and the families. And that, for that, I am grateful. I just have to agree with everything that everyone said, right? So this, this HBO team is amazing from every aspect of it, from medical to psych to, um, you know, even the guys in the gym. Like I come in contact with amazing individuals all the time and I'm blown away by their knowledge from our you know nutritionists to the PTs just it's, it's amazing to see the level of education devotion and compassion and care that we provide people it's not just service members it's everyone as a whole like I know that I can walk up to that tent and I can say hey I'm not feeling well today and you know I'm going to be taken care of and that's that's something that you don't find in other spaces, and that's unique to this environment. And it goes to the hiring that we have here, and to the level of like hungry, humble, hungry, humble, and smart of what we're looking for. And that's that's amazing. I think another a brag point on HBO is we are present all the time. So if we have a memorial workout, we form a team. If there's an event outside of work, we show up and we show up hard. Um, we went to Arlington for a funeral. We do everything as a unit and as a team because we are passionate about this. We want to support every way that we can. And we also want to be involved in the community. All right, ladies. So last question. This has been awesome. But round and third coming to home from your vantage point. Spouses that are coming in, the spouses who are considering this uh, as a future assignment, what's that one piece of advice you would give them as they leave, they uproot their household from their last assignment, and they're starting to head towards North Carolina and they're getting integrated? Each of your perspectives, what's that one piece of advice? Um, I would say 100% live in the Southern Pines area or surrounding areas. <laughs> So my husband does not communicate well, and he was here for about six months, uh, four to six months before I was, and he was like, oh, we'll just live in like Spring Lake. It's 10 minutes away from the base. You don't want to do that. Do a lot of research and just live in the Southern Pines area. Um, that's my... There's going to be a whole bunch of people cringe when they hear Spring Lake come out, but yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> I would say form a tribe. Uh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter where, where you slice or dice it, but connect in some form or fashion. Um, there are a lot of different things and different ways to engage. I know that um, when my spouse was active duty and we were stationed here in like 2007-ish, um, I joined a running club. It was great. 
And um, it was a great opportunity, not only for me to get my endorphins out and I run for t-shirts. So there was that, but then also I, I had some really great connections and engagement with people. So whatever your hobby is, don't be afraid to kind of put yourself out there and, and form a tribe um, and also prevention. You know, it, it's fine um, to know us and kind of put it in your back pocket to know that these resources are here, but it's always easier left of the boom. So if you see that you're having a little bit of tension, if you see that you're having a little bit of a challenge with communication, let us know. Um, you know, we can support and cover down. And if, you know, that's not what right looks like for you, there are a lot of other resources at your disposal in addition to the awesomeness of the embedded component. Um, it's not personal, you know, in, in that regard, it's, it's business. I want to get you where you need to go and, and what you need. So, you know, please ask prevention, form a tribe. I'm done. I rarely promote like blindly trusting things, but with how anxiety provoking moving is and moving your family, sometimes across the country or from state to state, starting new schools. I want you to have blind trust that this unit in this organization has got you. This team has got you. So if there's one thing that you do not need to worry about, it's that we've got you. And I would say from my perspective, it's don't wait to get involved, like learn from my mistake. Right. So when we first moved here to North Carolina, it was a huge adjustment coming from Washington State. And that was my biggest mistake is not getting involved and in doing things that I enjoyed when I lived in Washington. And it was anxiety provoking. It was really difficult. Um, but once you kind of lean in and you kind of start to find your own tribe, as Amy talked about, and your own kind of space and you get back involved by answering emails that Megan sends out and kind of going to those events, you create that that sense of community and it, it allows you to kind of blossom. And I think that that's one of the biggest pieces of advice I could give to spouses. Those were awesome. And I just want to maybe allay some fears out there for the, the Megans and the Trays out there who are really introverted and maybe they haven't tapped into resources at a previous unit. Nobody's going to force you to come to any functions or anything. What we're just trying to relay is that we have so much capability here to help you at any point that you decide you need help. And um, maybe just put your toe in the water a little bit and come test it out and then you shape it the way you want to shape it. But no, these this HBO team is solid and they are going to surround you when you need surrounded and they will pull back when you want them to pull back but they are they are just experts at what they do so don't don't mishear this podcast today and say oh my god i'm gonna be stressed out when i get there everybody's gonna be texting me and paging me and they're gonna call me and make me come in it's nothing like that what they are doing is just forming a network around you for when you are ready to tap into the network ladies this has been fabulous what i want to do before we get off of here is just give you a chance to um do you have any cleanup shots if you have anything else that you want to say? Piggybacking off of what you just said, I know when we say that we have um, events or things like that in our minds, when we don't picture it, sometimes we picture that there's a lot of people at these events, and that's not, not always how it happens. I remember that Megan put together a workout once, and there were maybe eight people there. And so we got to know the spouses pretty intimately, and we went and just worked out for an hour. And it wasn't this huge event, and it was something where we were able to build relationships. So I think that was an important point that you laid out. It's not always stressful or anxiety-provoking or a lot of people, but there are a lot of different opportunities. Ladies, it has been absolutely fabulous to have y'all on this week. I really do appreciate y'all taking the time out of your busy days to, to come and talk to me. Of course. Thank you, Trey. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right. That's it for another Insight Through Experience podcast, everybody. I want to give another big thank you to the Psych Squad for sitting down, taking time out of their busy schedules to just talk through what they do for the organization. And I'm kind of blown away, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm around them a lot, but just to hear their stories, uh, it's very humbling that we have that level of support and that the organization cares that much about its folks to make sure they're taken care of in that manner. So big thank you to those girls again and big thank you for, to the audience for tuning in and we will be back soon with another episode of Insight Through Experience Podcast. Hope everybody has a great week and weekend. <laughs>